This is the eighth video about wind turbines. We know that the cross sections of wind turbine blades are airfoils. In the last video, we talked about how the airfoil works and how the lift force is generated. So, in this video, we will talk about the velocity triangles associated with an airfoil. Uh, this discussion about the velocity triangles uh, will give us a more concrete idea about what those uh, axle and angular induction factors are their impact on the relative velocity between the wind and the blade and also prepares for later discussions about the blade element momentum method or the BEM method. So this is a front view. This is the front view of the rotor disc with three blades. The technique used in the BEM method is quite similar to how we analyzed the rotor disc model in the sixth video. So we will divide the rotor disc into many many concentric rings and examine the power generated by each ring. The total power generated by the entire rotor is just a summation of the power generated by each ring. Uh, in this example, in this particular figure, we are actually uh, looking at the ring with a radius of r, small r, small r, and a thickness of uh, dr. Right? Um, so, 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 so the the. The, the, the radius of the entire rotor disk is capital R, right? We are examining a, a ring that's inside of it with a radius of small r and a thickness of dr. Right? Uh, the cross section of the vertical blade at radius r, the cross section, if we take a cut of this vertical blade uh, and look at this cross section, then uh, we are, are going to see an air boil, right? We're going to see an air boil. Um, and if the angular speed of the rotation of the entire uh, of the blade is uh, capital omega, uh, then the linear speed of this particular airfoil at this particular cross section is going to be capital omega times radius r. That's going to be the linear speed. Uh, that's the front view. But if we take a top-down view, suppose our eyes are here, and then we look down at the rotor, right? and then we still cut off the top part of this uh, vertical blade right, and look at this particular cross section. What are we going to see? Right? What are we going to see? We're going to see this kind of thing. So the entire rotor disk, if we look from top above, it's going to become a line, which is denoted as this uh, black dash line here. Right? That's the plane of blade rotation, or called a rotor plane in short. Right? That's the rotor plane. Uh, the airfoil, the airfoil itself is not exactly aligned with the rotor plane. It's, uh, it is tilted. It is tilted with respect to the rotor plane. It's got an angle between them. So the, the angle, the angle between the core line, the angle between the core line of the airfoil and the rotor plane, is something that's called a section pitch angle. So later on, when we talk about BEM, you'll see that this pitch angle can be different at different radius, right? So at different radius, this pitch angle could be different. So the airfoils are tilted uh, by a different amount, right? are pitched by a different amount along the span, along the disc, al along the radius. Right? Uh, so when we talk about BEM, you'll see that this pitch angle can be different at different radius. So the entire blade is actually twisted. So the, the blade itself is actually twisted. This airfoil, this airfoil, this airfoil has a linear speed of Omega times R and is moving to the left, right? But if we use the airfoil itself as the reference frame, we assume that the airfoil itself is not moving; it's stationary. But everything else around it is actually moving, including the air is around it is moving. Then, then it, the speed of everything else, right, is going to be along this red arrow. Right? This red arrow has exactly the same length as the blue arrow, except that it's pointing in the opposite direction. So if we are using the airfoil itself as the reference frame, everything else, including the air, including the air around it, is moving along this red arrow. Right. And suppose suppose the air is not stationary, right? Suppose the air actually has a true speed, the, the, the speed of the wind. That's the true speed of the wind that is actually moving vertically. It's a, it's a, it's vertical, right? It's vertical. Then the relative velocity between the wind and this rotating, this moving airfoil, is going to be the true speed of the wind plus this red arrow, right? And then that's going to be a vector summation. Uh, so, so from the air, airfoil's perspective, 
uh, we have to sort of assume that the airfoil is kind of stationary and everything else is moving. So if that's the case, if that's the case, if we are using the airfoil's frame, um, then the wind speed, which is uh, U1, the true wind speed is U1, this green arrow here. We need to do a vector summation between this, uh, between this uh, green vector and this red vector in order to actually get the actual relative speed between the wind and this moving, this rotating air void, right? The vector sum summation must follow the so-called uh, uh, parallelogram uh, theorem. Right? Parallelogram theorem allows us to actually do vector summations. So basically we just uh, draw a parallelogram. In this particular case, because this angle is actually a vertical angle, so it's a rectangle, basically. So we're not drawing a parallelogram. Uh, par well, actually, drawing a rectangle. Right? So this is actually a rectangle, and then the vector, su the summation vector, the, uh, the summation of between of these two vectors is actually along the diagonal. This black arrow called a U R E L. Right? That's the vector summation of the green arrow and the red, red arrow. And this vector summation, this black arrow, is actually the the actual relative speed between the wind, which is flowing vertically, and this rotating blade rotating air for it, which is actually going in the blue, in, to going to the left. So in the literature, these three ve velocity vectors are often drawn as a triangle. They are not actually showing the bottom high half of the parallelogram of, of the of the rectangle. Right. It's actually the red vector is actually moved to the top. So you're actually connecting this vector with this vector head to tail basically. The, 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 the head of the green vector must be connected with the tail of the red vector. Right? And then you are seeing a triangle. Right? It's not a rectangle anymore, it's a triangle. And this angle is actually the 90 degree uh, right angle. Right? Um, and this angle phi between the, between the relative velocity and uh, the rotor plane this angle phi is called the angle of the relative wind, and is always, uh, in most of the literature, is always denoted as phi. Here, right? That's called the angle of the relative wind. It's actually the angle between the relative velocity and the rotor plane. So the rotation of the wind turbine blade uh, is going to induce some changes to the relative wind, wind speed. From the actuator disk analysis, we know that the wind speed actually seen by the turbine immediately in front of the rotor upwind is actually U2. It's not U1. It's actually U2, right? And U, U2 actually equals to U1 multiplying 1 subtract A. This A is something that we call an axial induction vector. Right? So this result is actually from the fifth video. If you if you don't exactly remember uh, what the axial induction factor actually is, you can take a look at the fifth video, uh, in which we talked about the best limit. Basically. So the rotation of the blades induces a velocity vector that's with a length of u1 multiplying a, and with a direction that's actually opposite to the direction of the true wind speed. This blue arrow here, right? This blue arrow here. This induced velocity this induced velocity is because this velocity, this blue arrow, is actually induced because of the rotation of the turbine. Right? Um, so if the if the rotation speed of the blade is still capital omega, right, then we don't need to change the length of the red arrow. So the red arrow is still the same. The length of the red arrow is still the same. Right? So all we have to do is to sort of uh, sort of shift this red arrow from, from this position down here to account for the reduced length of the green arrow. Again, the reduce the, 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 the tail of the green arrow reduced by this uh, length, right, must still connect with the, the, the tail of the red arrow, basically. Right? So in order to actually, in order to actually uh, do a vector summation for the, for the reduced green arrow and the red arrow. So the so the entire velocity triangle needs to be redrawn, right? And the arrow, the red arrow, needs to be shifted down downward to account for this reduction 
of the length of this uh, green arrow. Um, so the relative wing speed vector has changed its direction and also the length also, right? The, the black dash line was the relative velocity without accounting for this reduction in the axial direction, right? But if we account for this reduction in the axial direction, the relative wing speed is actually along this black arrow now, right? Both the length and the angle has changed. The angle, the, the angle of the relative wing has increased a little bit, actually. Right? That's a new angle of relative wing phi. So, in our rotor disk analysis in the sixth video, we introduced the angular induction factor, which is denoted as A prime. And it's defined as the ratio between the angular speed of the wake after the rotor plane, which is small again here, and two multiplying the angular speed of the blade. That's two times the capital over there. Right. So in front of the rotor plane, in front of the rotor plane, the air is not rotating, right? The, but the blade is rotating at the speed of capital omega. So the relative angular speed between the wind and the blade is just a capital omega. So behind the rotor plane, if we account for the wake in the rotating uh, air behind the rotor plane, then the air in the wake is rotating at a speed that's a small omega. Right. And because it's rotating in the opposite direction from the uh, rotor plate, uh, from the blade, so the relative angular speed between the blade and the wake the rotating wake is capital omega plus small omega. Right. So that's 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 immediately behind the rotor plane, right? So that's immediately in front of the rotor plane. So what's actually rel the relative angular speed between the wind and the air at the rotor plane, right? So a reasonable a reasonable approximation is just a capital omega plus small omega divided by half, uh, divided by two, one half small omega. And if we actually replace small omega with the definition of a prime, right? A, so small omega equals to what? Small omega equals to a prime times two times capital omega, right? And then divide by two, we get rid of the two, right? And then it's just a, a prime times capital omega. So it's omega plus a prime times capital omega. So collect the capital omega, we get a one plus a prime. Right? So so at the rotor plane. The relative angular speed between the air and the, the turbine or, to, or or the blade is capital omega times one plus a prime, right? Um, so 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 because the angular relative velocity is um, is increased by this a prime multiplying capital omega, it's no longer capital omega, right? It's a, it's a capital omega plus capital omega times a prime, right? You got like a increase, you have increased the, the, the rotation speed by, by the relative, the relative angular velocity by a little, a little bit, which is a prime times omega, times capital omega. So the linear relative velocity must also increase by some amount, and that amount is capital omega times r times a prime. Right? So, so the length of the rate vector the length of the rotor vector is still capital omega times r, right? but because of this kind of a rotation of the wake, you get an, one, some additional length here. So the the length of the rotor vector is uh, no longer correct. If we want to account for this induced angular velocity, which is the blue arrow here, right? The length of the red arrow has to be increased. Right? It has to be increased a little bit. Right? So the new linear velocity is just the, the blue arrow plus the red arrow. Right? Because both arrows are actually in the same direction, so the resulting vector is just a, a vector that goes from the tail of the blue, blue arrow to the head of the red arrow. Right? That's, the, that's, the, that's the summation of the two vectors in the same direction, pointing in the same direction. Right? And then the new relative wind speed must be adjusted again. To take into account the the, the, the angular induced speed, this blue area here. Right? So the angle of 
So the angle of the relative wind speed phi is again increased by some little amount, by some amount. Right? So, so, so this this black dash arrow is uh, without considering the axle or the radio, uh, the the angular induction velocities, right? And uh, this this black dash arrow accounts for the axle induction velo induced velocity, but does not account for the, the, the angular induced velocity. Right? And then this solid black arrow accounts for both kinds of induced velocity. Um, these two blue arrows, these two blue air vectors, uh, and they are actually also connected head to tail, right? Head to tail. Both of them are induced velocities. This 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 vertical blue vector is the axle induced velocity, and it's actually going against the direction of the wind. Right? And then this horizontal, this horizontal blue vector is the angular induced velocity, and it's actually in the same direction as um, the, the 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 angular ang uh, the linear velocity of the blade actually the, the red arrow. Right? So the total induced velocity is what? The total velo induced velocity is just this arrow, this vector plus this vector, and because they are already connected head to tail, right? We, all we have to do is to connect the tail of this blue vector with the head of this blue vector. Yeah. Denote as big W here. This big W gives us the total induced velocity, which is a vector summation of this vertical blue line, a blue ve vector, and this horizontal blue vector. Right? And the direction of this total induced vector, the direction of it, the direction of this vector, uh, is actually perpendicular to the direction of the relative wind. Uh, so, so this angle is actually a right, uh, it's a 90 degree right angle. The length of the W actually stops here, right? But uh, this dash line is just an extension of this W vector so that we can see the inter intersection of the directions. Right? This is actually a right angle. And this, is, this right angle is actually a consequence of something that's called kuda Joukowsky uh, theorem. This kuda Joukowsky theorem is actually a quite fundamental theorem uh, in the field called a poten a potential fluid theory. Uh, a detailed explanation about this particular equation is beyond the scope of this video, but all we need to know is that, is that this W vector is actually perpendicular to the relative speed. Right? And, and this right angle holds true as long as there is no uh, turbulence or there is no stall. Right? So, the, so in, the, in the last video we talked about the possibility of stall. As long as the airfoil is not in a stored state, right, then this, this vector is always perpendicular to the uh, to the relative wind speed direction. Right? So this is actually a right angle. This is a right angle. And don't forget this is also a right angle, right? Because we're assuming that the direction of the wind is perpendicular to the uh, rotor plane. Right? In practice it's uh, it's not exactly true, right? But uh, most of the wind turbines these days have have uh, have uh, have yaw control. Have something that's called yaw control. The yaw control allows you to actually rotate the the, the plane of blade rotation uh, to be perpendicular to the incoming wind direction. Right? Um, so 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 this is also a right angle. This is a this is a this is a ninety degree angle. And then we know that this angle must be equal to this angle, right? Because uh, this is a straight line. Right. The dash line here is just a straight line extension of the of the of the blue arrow here, right. and we know that this horizontal blue arrow is in the same direction as the red arrow. So both of them is actually along a straight line. So this angle must be exactly equal to this angle. Right. So both of them are actually right angle right angle triangles. Right. So this triangle and then this triangle, if we examine them, right. If we examine this angle is the same, this angle is the same, right? And then the last angle must be, be exactly the same because the summation of the three angles in a triangle must be 180 degrees, right? So if this, these two angles are identical, these two angles are identical, then these two an are, angles must be identical, right? Which tells us what? 
If this angle is phi, then this angle must be phi too. Right? So both the angles are actually phi. Both angles are actually phi. So now we can actually look at the tangent of this particular angle. So if we look at this large velocity triangle, this one, composed of this green arrow, this blue plus the red arrow, and then this black arrow, right? the tangent of phi equals to what? The tangent of phi equals to the length of this vector, which is u1 multiplied 1 subtract a, this vector, dividing the length of this vector, the, the entire thing, which is omega r a prime plus omega r. Right? Omega r, if we collect omega r, then it's 1 plus a prime. right? So the tangent of phi equals to this divided by this. Right? And then if we examine this small tri velocity triangle for the induced velocities, then tangent of phi equals to what? Tangent of phi equals to the length of this vector, which is omega r a prime, right? And then divided by the length of this thing. That's u1 a. u1 a. Right? So we can do some algebra on this particular equality, right? So, for example, multiplying a prime, uh, dividing a prime on both sides of the equation, dividing a prime on both sides of the equation, right? So a prime comes to the denominator, and then, uh, and then what? And then uh, multiplying a on both sides of the equation, right? So a and a cancels out. A comes to no, uh, numerator. Right? So a, so a times one subtract a divided by a prime times one plus a prime. Is gonna equal to what? It's, it's gonna equal to omega o, uh, omega, capital omega times r divided by u one. That's the speed of the wind, right? And then squared. In the in video six, we introduced this a uh, concept called a uh, quantity that's called a local tip speed ratio, right? Local tip speed ratio. So, so so this expression is exactly the definition of the local tip speed ratio called lambda r. So this thing actually equals to lambda r squared. So that's the that's the result based on this kind of analysis of just the velocity triangles. Right. Um, so 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 this equation is actually. Uh, uh, an equation that we have divided, we have derived before. In, the, uh, in 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 the in the sixth video, we obtained the exact same equation. So this is a slide that I actually copied over from the sixth video, right? and we obtained the exact same equation, but using a different method. Right? Um, so 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 um, in that particular video, we obtained this equation based on considering the pressure jump. Between position two and position three. Position two is uh, immediately in front of the rotor disc, and position three is immediately after the rotor disc. So we're talking about the pressure jump across this uh, rotor disc, right? and uh, this pressure jump can be obtained by two different uh, two different ways. So in video six, when we talk about the rotor disc model, right, this pressure jump was obtained by considering the Bernoulli's equation between position two and position three. Right. That's delta P A prime. And then eventually we obtained a expression for the delta P A prime, which is expressed in terms of A prime, the angular induction factor. Right. A prime. And from video five, we talked when we talked about the actuator disk model, we also obtained another expression for the same pressure jump. Right. And that expression was expressed in terms of uh, the axial induction factor, A. Right. And because both pressure jumps must be equal to each other, there is only one pressure jump across the rotor disk. Right. So both the, both expression must be equal to each other. And this equality, and this equality, delta P A prime equals to delta P A, gave us this expression for lambda r squared. But here we have obtained exactly the same equation based on purely just the geometrical considerations of the velocity triangles.